Wasting money on cures Forgot how to fix myself They say that time is free Then why is it so precious? Oh, I'll say Okay, hi everybody, it's Friday. Welcome to the ninth and the last of our series of Easter revision sessions. Consider how many minutes we've totted up. It's a lot, and some of you have come to every single session. So hats off to you. We'll try and give you a shout out during the uh, during the next 30 minutes or so. Our focus is gonna be on the UK economy. Uh, we've got a series of short answer questions and things, and lots of things for you to have a go at. If you're watching live with us today, uh, remember to hit the subscribe button to so you can contribute to the group chat. Uh, and critically, if you're watching on replay, just press the pause button anytime you like. If you want to take a moment on a question or write down some some data, some good knowledge, some application, or to take a screenshot. Okay, let's make a start. I've got a little high or low activity for you. Is unemployment higher or lower measured as a percentage of the labour force than well, let's start off with the UK. UK's unemployment, as many of you will know, is 3.7%, which is pretty low. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Next country coming up is... Next country coming up is Germany. Now, is Germany... Does Germany have a higher or lower percentage rate of unemployment than the UK? What do we think? Post your answers in the chat window. We'll pick out a few people as they come through. A lot of people saying higher. Uh, obviously, there's a nice mix. I see people think some people think Germany has lower unemployment than the UK. Uh, Alex thinks higher. Josh thinks lower. Phoebe thinks uh, lower. Ben thinks higher. What do we think? UK 3.7%. Uh, Henry is, is, says it's 3.5% in Germany. Let's have a look, see if Henry's right. In fact, using the ILO, ILO measure, the standardized measure, German unemployment is quite a bit higher 5.6%. That's lower than the European Union average, but it's a bit higher than the UK. Of course, low unemployment is one of the strengths of the UK at the, at the moment. 
What about Spain? Higher or lower than Germany? What do we think? So unemployment in Germany, 5.6%. What is it in Spain? This is a really good country for relative uh, comparative economics. Oh, yeah, some nice points coming in. Higher, especially for younger workers. Sean and Josh and Phoebe and Ruben all saying it's higher. Some people say it's as high as 13%. Let's have a look. And in fact, for Spain, it is indeed 13%. I think youth unemployment is something like two and a half times that level. So superb answers. Now that's Spain, 13%. Your next country is coming up on the screen. It's Greece. Now this, I think, will divide opinion. Is unemployment in Greece higher or lower than in Spain? Greece often used as an exemplar country by students of, a, of an economy that's gone through financial economic and social and political crises in the last 15 years. What do we think? Chris Tyson thinks it's lower, around 10%, whereas Vivek thinks it's about 11.5%. Uh, Bruno Pagano, one of our regular contributors, Bruno's gone for 11.4%. A lot of people thinking lower. Here's the answer coming in. Current rate is, in fact, 11.4%. I think some of you have clearly either memorized a load of data from the IMF or are using well-known artificial intelligence software. Now, here's the last question, sort of the last country. Poland. Poland's really interesting. I love, I love studying in Poland. It's inside the European Union. It's outside the single currency. It has a floating exchange rate, the Zloty. It's a country that's chosen to stay outside the euro, but of course, it's fundamentally part of the single market. What, are, what do we think? Poland, lower or higher than Greece? Paddy Corbett thinks it's lower. Uh, what do we got here? Tom thinks it's lower. Um, what do we think? Well, Robin talking about skills gaps due to labor migrating out of Poland. So maybe a brain drain effect. Here's the answer coming up. 5.5%. Poland has lower unemployment than Germany. Now that's something to impress maybe your better half or a significant other at lunchtime or, or this evening. Poland has lower unemployment than the German economy. Uh, but UK has the lowest of all those countries. Let's crack on then. So we're going to look at uh, some macroeconomics. I have two slides for you, which you might want to take a screenshot of or just jot them down very quickly. But during the course of this, this next half an hour, I've got two slides. I thought I'd put together 16 absolutely key bits of information which you should know before you take the exam in May and June. So inflation in the UK is currently 10.4%, probably peaked about 11%, but it's now 10.4%. The economy grew last year by 4.1%. Clearly it's going to be weaker in 2023, but actually the growth in 2021 was very strong. That was the year we rebounded from the pandemic. We came out of the lockdown in the spring of uh, 2021. Base rate, of course, 4.25%. We'll talk about that today. Unemployment low, 3.7%. Wage growth, 5.7% at the moment, which of course is below inflation. The yield on government debt, 3.4%. The, the government can borrow, borrow money for 10 years at 3.4%. Sterling has just reached a 10-month high against the dollar of $1.25. And you should definitely know that the minimum wage went up by 10% this year, 1st of April. So for older workers, it's now £10.42 per hour. This is little bits of information, which if you go into the exam, you can just scatter little bits of application and get terrific credit for doing so. Let's look at unemployment. So I've, I've, there is so much I could cover in today's session. We don't have the time to cover the whole of the UK economy. So I've just chosen four or five areas for you to, uh, to revise. Now here's unemployment. Unemployment in the UK, of course, is low, 3.7%. Uh, the peak uh, in 2011 after the global financial crisis was 8%. But of course, in 2020, the fear was we'd return to that kind of level of joblessness. The furlough scheme prevented that. What I say to my students when I'm teaching unemployment is that's the, that's the overall figure. But the really strong students at A-level can dig beneath the data. They can disaggregate and look at a level below the more kind of granular detail. I just want to pick on two aspects of that. And here's the next slide. So um, this chart shows the number of vacancies, jobs that are out there but not yet being filled. I think this could be an exam question because it's so topical this time last year. 
the number of vacancies was going up and up and up to a record high of 1.3 million, which was almost the same as the level of unemployment at the time. So there's your chart. Here's my challenge to the group. Can you please uh, give me two reasons, just two, for why the UK has such a high level of job vacancies? What can we come up with in the chat? Okay, Kay talks about Brexit and retirement. There's some evidence about a lot of people in their 50s have taken early retirement. And Jay talks about occupational immobility due to issues such as the lack of skills for required jobs. Great, great idea from Jay there. He's using an economic concept as part of the explanation. That's always credited as part of analysis. Uh, Millie talking about COVID. Lots of people retired and uh, after COVID reassessed their, their work-life priorities, their work-life balance. Alex talks about, and this is great application. This is the kind of extra knowledge that makes such a difference. 575,000 people have left the workforce since 2020 and have become economically inactive, possibly due to long COVID or other reasons. They may be having to uh, look after a, an ill relative, for example, or maybe they've gone back into full-time education. So some great answers there that shows terrific understanding. I don't think we can get away from it. It's the elephant in the room that Brexit the government, of course, we ended free movement in the single market. We left the single market and Brexit has made it harder to recruit workers from the EU, particularly in sectors such as hospitality, travel, tourism, social care and construction. Now, you'll see in the presentation today the, the, the green bold phrase such as strong recommendation, please. When you get a question on the UK economy and you need to know your stuff for the exam, if you use the phrase such as it invites good application and I want you to get the application marks. Others who aren't here, they can ignore, we can ignore them. If you use phrases such as, such as social care and construction, you don't need to know the data. Alex had a fantastic bit of data. That's amazing for him. You don't need to know the data, just the relevant example. And I think skills gaps and low pay, they've kind of linked in many ways, but there are lots of skills gaps in emerging sectors, including software engineering, etc. And there's a lot of issues to do with working poverty. Relative wages have fallen for many occupations. Real wages have fallen. And lots of businesses are saying that they're having a, a double problem. The problem is recruitment and retention. And that's definitely worth putting into your revision notes today. Recruitment and retention. The retail battle for workers between Aldi and Lidl and Tesco and Pret and Starbucks. There are a lot, a lot of them are raising wages two or three times just this year alone. So some great answers there. Well done. Phoebe says, will examiners Google your data or do they like have a booklet of data to fact check? That's a great question, Phoebe. And the answer is examiners will apply a reality check to your answers. If they feel something's way out of kilter, it's just off the planet, off the scale, they might check it. But don't worry, there won't be they won't have a kind of cheap cheap UK economy study companion by their side, although perhaps they should do. Here's my next uh, question. We're digging beneath the labour market here. This chart shows the percentage of people who've been out of work in the UK for more than a year. It's not the level of unemployment, it's how long people have been out of work for. And in fact, about 25% on average, figures come down recently, which is good news, about a quarter of people have been out of work, have been out of work for at least 12 months. So here's my challenge to the group. Here's my question. Can you please give me two specific policies to help reduce long term unemployment? Have a go. Uh, 
Okay, so Charlie talking about subsidizing skills acquisition. Reaper's talking about supply side policies such as apprenticeships and things. Uh, and uh, the burrito, improved education to improve occupation mobility. Now, that's a really interesting answer. There's nothing wrong with that answer. It's fine. To, to make it really sing for you and score for you in the exam, you just have to make it a little bit more detail. Give me a, an example of an education policy which just gives you that extra application. Alex Power talks about supply side policies of re-education and training programs for structurally unemployed workers. Like that brings in a concept. Well, here's my two uh, options. Again, they're not perfect, but I think that makes the point. And notice there the green bold, such as, so encouraging employers to hire long-term unemployed people. The government has actually reduced national insurance paid by the employer if they take on a long-term unemployed person, I think they can save £3,000 a year. So that's a specific example. Investments in skills training, such as training in coding or even financial support for job search. So as long as you can make it specific, you will get the extra credit in the exam. So well done on that. Uh, let's look at a related topic, and that's migration. Here's the data for migration. Keep in mind, by the way, that the, the exam was set last year. So they might, repeat, might give you some migration data, which kind of finishes in 2021. And there was a big fall in migration in 2020, as you know, because of the pandemic. A lot of people left the UK. A lot a fewer people came in, including tens of thousands of students. Um, here's my question. Uh, my question is, coming up, can you give me three consequences for the UK of a fall in net inward migration? Have a go. I like uh, what's coming through. Quite a few of you focusing on both demand and supply side consequences, which is good for evaluation. So Noah's point is a lack of skilled migrants coming into the country. So productivity could potentially uh, drop as a result. Uh, Kavi talks about the lack of labor in the low skilled sectors, such as carers. Um, that's a really good point. Okay. Uh, lots of points coming through there. Really, really good. And uh, here are my three. Again, let's take a moment on this. Again, I'm trying to think about how we link it to key concepts and a bit of such as seasoning. A fall in net migration, if it's sustained, will probably act as a drag on growth because the labor force won't grow as quickly. It could even decline. Consequences for low and aggregate supply, which many people mentioned in the chat window. And then link it to an increase in labor shortages in sectors such as construction. So it's going to worsen the housing shortage. On the fiscal side, the evidence is, and it's quite strong evidence, by the way, John from Portes at the National Institute when he was there, uh, now at UCL, uh, made a, a detailed research study saying, found that migrant workers who work pay more in taxes, income tax, national insurance, VAT, than they actually claim in welfare. Uh, so there could be a fiscal consequence for the government. Many migrants, by the way, start up new businesses, which is a source of future tax revenue. And quite a few of you have studied demographics, maybe as a development point of, point of view, so if migration falls, it could make the aging population worse. The median age could go up. Dependency ratio could rise. Typically, of course, migrants coming into the UK are younger of working age and uh, raising families. So that was a little questionnaire on migration. Well done. Let's think about something else. I'm just trying to pick out some little bits and pieces here in the UK. You definitely need to know external shocks. The UK economy is an open economy. Uh, you know, 70% of our GDP is trade related. So what happens in other economies will impact on the UK. Here's a chart showing the monthly price of Brent crude in dollars per barrel. And of course it jumped up uh, from about $40 in October, 2020 to 71 a year later, and then $123 in the summer of last year when the exam was set. It's fallen back a bit since, but here's my question for the group. Can you please give me two consequences for higher oil prices 
of higher oil prices. Sorry, for two UK macro objectives. Over to you. Jacob had a nice point about the cost of petrol going up at the pumps, affecting lots of industries. Ollie talks about inflation effects uh, from cost push inflation due to increased commodity prices, possibly increased unemployment if real output suffers. And Bruno talks about high levels of cost push inflation taking the UK away from the target of 2% inflation, contraction in aggregate uh, supply. That should actually be an inward shift of aggregate supply if it's cost push inflation causing a contraction of aggregate demand. Now, I love this point from Jovni worsens the current account deficit as imports are less price competitive uh they're more, they're more expensive clearly i'm actually going to make that point in my in my thoughts alex comes in leads to cost push inflation inflation is regressive so it could have a consequence for inequality and relative poverty superb really good points there really good points here are my answers uh, an increase in cost push inflation, yes. Inward shift of aggregate supply. We don't forget we import most of our oil these days. So an inward shift of aggregate supply that causes prices to go up in industries such as, here we go again, such as petrochemicals, plastic manufacturing, obviously transport sector, hitting real incomes and growth. And I think the point was made by Javni there in the previous um, point, the trade balance. UK is a net importer of oil as well as gas. Demand is price inelastic, so in theory the trade balance will worsen. Although actually in the long run, if oil prices stay high, we might get some more investment in Aberdeen and northeast, northeast of Scotland there. Well done on that one. Next point coming up, we said we've done oil prices. I want to spend a little bit of time looking at this chart. This is super important. So this chart basically shows the growth of GDP every year since 1980. Uh, by the way, I took my A-levels in 1982 which ages me just a little bit. So I took my A-levels 41 years ago. And you are all definitely better economists than I am. Now, this chart shows the growth in the economy. The red bit's obviously a recession, 2009, 2020. But the green line is the really key bit here. Sometimes the examiners are now putting in a trend line. So the trend is just the average, the moving average over time. So that's been plotted. You can see it is falling. It's now below two percent so growth in the uk is quite sluggish quite flat we're not growing very quickly uh, 2021 was a, an aberration in that sense so here's my challenge to you as a group can you please give me three reasons that might explain this slow long-run growth in the uk what can you come up with Okay, some great answers coming through. Again, keep in mind, it's not easy to type an answer in 30 seconds. And you can always come back to this session, maybe have a bit more time on it. Uh, YV talks about persistent current account deficit and aging population and low productivity. There seems to be a word which is appearing a lot, and that is the word productivity. KB, love this answer. Love this answer from KB. Low levels of business investment evident after Brexit and especially the the sort of shock waves and the ripple effects of the financial crisis. Superb. Giovanna talks about structural inequalities in the UK, north and south, as well as poor productivity. That's interesting. That's hinting at sort of economic geography, that the, the endemic, the persistent gaps within the UK, not just north, south, often within regions. Harris talks about the productivity puzzle we face, a lack of immigration, a lack of incentives for inward FDI. Now that 
keep in mind, of course, this you, you have time in the exam to write an answer. The key of these sessions, the idea of give me three is if you can think of three things, three factors, you can always build a great answer in a time pressured exam. So well done for those points. Productivity appears at the top of my list. Productivity, productivity, productivity. The growth of output per person in the UK has been very slow the last 15 years, 20 years or so. Now a huge gap in terms of efficiency between the UK and Germany, for example. Part of that's linked to point two here. We have a very low investment as a share of GDP. A weak investment means that businesses are working with a much older capital stock. It tends to depreciate more quickly and can break down. Investment only 18% of GDP, the lowest of the leading high income countries. And critically, the third point is an external point. We have this big trade deficit, big current account deficit, and our export to GDP ratio is now falling. It's the only European country where that's is happening. Of course, there's a clue there because we're no longer inside the European Union. According to the government last year, the number of businesses exporting to the EU fell to 18,000 from in 2021 from 27,000 in, in 2019. Fewer businesses are now exporting. Brexit is the elephant in the room in this case. Leaving the single market is slowing economic growth in the UK. This next chart actually gives it a hint here. Because growth has been so slow, per capita GDP, this time expressed in dollars, has barely changed since 20, 27, 28, just before the financial crisis. Indeed, it's lower now than it was in 2007. Sorry to be depressing about this. This is the truth. This is the reality. Now, here's my second slide. Again, I'll quickly work through these. So I've given you 16 bits of data here that I think are essential knowledge for the exam. UK run to budget deficit. Last year, 5% of GDP. It was 15% in 2021, of course, because of the pandemic and furlough. The national debt is 2.2 trillion. It's about 100% of GDP. Don't worry if you say it's 97%, the examiner's not gonna check that. We have the highest tax burden since the post-war period. Now 38% of GDP will be in the next couple of years. We were in a massive trade deficit in goods, 231 billion last year. But last year, we also had our biggest ever trade surplus in services. Of course, the gap is quite big there. We we're running a big current account deficit of 4% of GDP last year, but it's going up. Britain sank five places last year in the World Economic Forum's competitiveness ranking. And our GDP per capita has fallen back relative to other countries. It's about $46,000 PPP, USA 70,000. But look at Ireland. Ireland now has a higher per capita income, PPP, than the UK. But of course, a lot of this is the, uh, the, in the transfer pricing, the profits flowing into Ireland from multinational corporations based around the world, especially in Europe, to take advantage of Ireland's low corporation tax. Again, this kind of data, do you know how much data do you need to know? A little bit, but not too much. If you have enough data, you can absolutely shine in the exam. Okay, a couple more things to finish with. Uh, here's a really important chart showing unemployment in the UK in orange there, falling and staying pretty low, but then the big rise in inflation in 21 and in particular 2022. Quite a few people in the chat were talking about the Phillips curve and I thought I'd just post this one minute challenge question to you. Here's my question and just have a go at writing an answer and we'll post a few up on the on the screen. Must the rate of unemployment rise for inflation in the UK to fall? There's your challenge. Who can write me a lovely little sentence or two on that? Have a go.
Okay, if you can write anything in a minute, uh, you have my un, uh, uh, incredible respect. So I want to pick out on Bruno's answer here. So here we go. So the answer is his answer is no, or not necessarily. In recent times, the relationship between inflation and unemployment has decoupled. Previous relationships have kind of broken down in that sense. This is due in part to decreasing strength of unions. Only 23% of people uh, are members of a union. Uh, high levels of migration due to globalization, et cetera. So there's a nice bit of evaluative nuance to writing there, which is terrific. Uh, do you need to know all the data for this kind of stuff? No, you don't. If you have it, it's kind of useful, but you just need to be able to just build an argument. Here's Mungo's answer, not necessarily. The main factor, by the way, that is nuanced evaluation. The main factor influencing upwards inflationary pressure has been significant external costs such as COVID-19 and the Russian war in Ukraine. Now, I'm going to highlight the answer there because the main factor, significant. Those little words are uh, qualifying words. They are they give a little bit of emphasis to the answer. Maybe we can find one more. Uh, what have we got here? My producer is choosing them. Here's Reapers. According to the Phillips curve, yes. However, long-run policies such as supply-side policies increase employment and growth without inflationary pressure. Now, that's a really good point. All we would have to do to improve that would be to give me a couple of examples of supply side policies that might uh, raise productivity, for example. Productivity growth is non-inflationary or get more people into the into the labor force. Here's my lame example of a paragraph. I tried to type this in a minute, actually. There are many domestic and external causes of inflation. One has been the sharp rise in global food and energy prices, causing a fall in aggregate supply. If input prices start falling, the oil, the gas, the copper, the food, disinflation will happen whilst the economy continues to continue, continue to grow since there's less downward pressure on real disposable incomes. Now, that's an answer there without any data in it, without any numbers, but it's still a good application. We talk about disinflation, the rise in food and energy prices. So there we go. That was an interesting challenge. In, in your revision in the days and weeks to come, do have a go at the one minute challenge set yourself a minute get the old clock out get our music out and give yourself a minute to write something and you'll be amazed what you can do two more questions to finish here we go here's one on exchange rates pound against the dollar a little bit of recovery in sterling of course i think we've reached a 10 month high it's now 125. i just wanted to show this chart this is the pound since 2007 we could you could get two dollars to the pound just before the financial crisis uh, so the pound has been a sort of long-term nominal decline let's look at depreciation then here's the challenge for you can you please give me three possible effects for the uk of a depreciation in the exchange rate have a go Ethan talking about the terms of trade worsening, quite bespoke, but certainly useful. Our in the reminds us of WIDEC, uh, these are expensive imports, cheaper exports. So net exports rise, consumption of exports increase. So in theory, should be beneficial for aggregate demand. Um, Luca talks about imports more expensive, demand for imports falls, the current account improves, improvement in AD. Bank of England, by the way, reckons a 5% fall in the exchange rate is equivalent to about a 1% cut in interest rates. Ah, Liam decides to evaluate. Uh, possible Jacob effect in the long run if the Marshall learning condition is satisfied. The Jacob effect will be in the short run. Uh, the balance of payments would improve, the current account will improve if the Marshall learning condition is satisfied going forward. Superb answers there. Here are my thoughts on this. There's so much you can write about. Increasing cost push inflation. Then we get most of our import supplies to other than dollars or euros. The, the trade balance in the short term might worsen, Jacob effect there, particularly if the elasticities are low for imports and exports. Another slightly wider point, looking at it, expanding the canvas, if the pound is weak against the dollar, a lot of American companies might think of investing in the UK, maybe to build a, 
a battery plant in the Northumberland area or maybe build a, a, a car plant somewhere. Uh, but there's also a risk that UK firms would be vulnerable to take over because the dollars will buy more pounds and therefore a lot of UK companies might become quite attractive for, for takeovers. A uh, key point about depreciation, everybody, is that it has demand and supply side effects. So look to build that into your analysis. Last task today. Well done, everybody, on the superb effort on the macro front. This is hugely encouraging. Here's a key chart showing inflation in blue. Um, hopefully, Peter, 11%, fingers crossed. And base interest rates, the Bank of England, moving interest rates away from 0.1%. They've been below 1% for more than a decade and uh, up to 4.25% as we speak. Let's think about interest rates going up. Over to you for the last question. Can you please type into the window some effects of the sustained rise in interest rates by the Bank of England? How's it going to affect the Okay, some good answers coming through. Viha has a nice point about uh, uh, causing hot money to flow into the UK. Alex reinforces that. So one of the in uh, consequences of interest rates going up could be an appreciation of the exchange rate. Of course, other countries have also raised interest rates. So what matters there in Alex's point is the relative rate of interest for hot money flows. Quite a few people talking about uh, mortgages becoming more expensive. Danny talks about decrease in borrowing decrease in investment and consumption, therefore reducing growth in the UK. It's always the risk, isn't it? If you raise interest rates to control inflation, you might you might trigger a recession uh, when you don't really need to. Jerry has some nice points here. Mortgage payments become more expensive, leading to less demand for new home buyers, thus reducing house prices, causing a negative wealth effect, a fall in consumption, and thus AD. Now, Jerry is clearly one of the ace chain of reasoning generators in the Tutor Duke Collective. Some lovely little chains of reading, reasoning there, which are terrific. Fergus, more expensive to borrow, therefore less disposable income to consume. Consumption is 65% of GDP, so therefore a slowdown or possibly negative growth in the economy. And here's Sam's point. An increase in the cost of mortgages causing demand for housing to decrease, house prices to fall, could cause a negative wealth effect. Wow, superb answers there. Here are my three, just quickly. Yeah, I, I picked out the housing market. There is a risk of a drop in house prices. I think actually property prices are now falling in the UK, according to the Nationwide Index. And of course, that has knock-on effects for construction sector, for jobs, to output and investment in building. I think a really big, the big news story in 2023 could be that lots of companies borrowed money during the pandemic at low interest rates. So there's a huge amount of corporate debt, never mind government debt, and as interest rates go up, a lot of businesses are highly geared and are struggling to meet the interest payments. Now, some, some can go to the stock market and raise new equity, but many businesses had borrowed to survive the pandemic and the recession are now facing up to some significant costs. Not just interest rates, of course, energy costs and lots of other rises in corporation tax and so on and so forth. And critically, if borrowing costs go up, it could cause planned investment by businesses to fall, uh, along with the corporation tax rise, I guess, and that has consequences for supply as well as demand. Wow, amazing. One more slide from me. Oh, wow, thank you for resetting for the super chat. Go buy yourself something with a YED of greater than plus one. Well, that doesn't, that narrows it down a little bit, but I'll have to give that some thought. Just a couple of key points for me for, as you head into the macro phase. First of all, Know your main macro numbers. Okay, I've given you 16 of them today, probably quite a few more in, in the chat. So as long as you know the key numbers, you will be fine. Okay, You don't need to know an encyclopedic level of detail. Have good examples, please, of specific policies, demand and supply side policies to encourage growth. We will do a session on supply side policies. We'll talk about that in a second. 
most problems unemployment trade deficits low productivity most of these kind of thorny issues require a mix of policies so that allows you to evaluate the effectiveness of policies i think for this year for this summer exam pay close attention to external shocks things that happen outside our domestic economy and how they impact on the uk and my last point is really important perhaps the most important point i make in all of my teaching to my macro students so i'll make it to you macroeconomics has micro foundations it's the decisions of businesses about whether to invest or export it's the decisions of people whether to work or not or to migrate the micro decisions of people and businesses have at an aggregate level macroeconomic consequences and many of the policies we've talked about are actually micro policies so if you get the micro side right pretty much especially on the supply side you can get better macro outcomes just before we wound up wind up quick reminder we are on the road next week we are heading to Portsmouth, bristol birmingham and then the week after to london It'd be absolutely fantastic if some of you could join us for our live grade booster events they are great fun tremendous facilities the view cinemas and things fantastic big screen entertainment so please do join us for those if you can't make the live events by the way quick reminder we have our online course which is fantastic value i mean tens of hours of extra material brilliantly produced the grade booster online course if you can't make the live events is a great investment for the next 30 40 days or so that said just want to say a big thank you a couple of thank yous first of all to jim my producer if you can say thank you to jim in the chat window please uh, he's my stunt double outside of uh, normal life but he's been producing and posting up some of the answers on the chat window from from our collective I also want to say a big thank you uh, to those who have been to every single of these nine Easter revision sessions. I feel like we've got to know you uh, over the course of the last two weeks and you're all terrific economists working super hard on your revision. If you found the session uh, useful, enjoyable, could you please consider giving it a like as we'd love to beat our friends in business studies. We smashed them out of the park yesterday, by the way. Um, most of all, stay focused, stay really, really focused on your revision. We'll be doing some more live streams, uh, first week of May and onwards, supply side economics, financial economics, competition policy, lots more topics to come. Thank you for joining us over the last two weeks. It's been a real privilege being your teacher for the last nine sessions. Stay happy, stay positive, stay curious, and see you sometime soon.